Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Sheikha Dunyo, and I'm the Director of Education Programs at NORD. I'll be your host for today's webinar on patient registries, what they are, and how to start one. We're happy to have you join us today. This is actually the second in a new series that we've launched for patients and caregivers. We have a number of topics in the works, including what is genetic testing and how can it benefit me. So please look out for future webinars, and we hope that you're able to join us. Before we get started, I'd like to take a brief moment to talk a little bit about NORD, um, in case you're not familiar. NORD is an organization committed to the identification, treatment, and cure of rare diseases through education, advocacy, research, and patient services. You can learn more about NORD's programs, services, and resources, and how to get involved on our website at rarediseases.org. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we have a number of programs that can help you along your journey. Um, and so before I introduce our speakers, I, I do want to just mention one resource um, before we get started. Uh, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS, which is a part of NIH, um, is working closely with patient advocates, and they've developed a toolkit for patient-focused therapy development. Um, and actually, the toolkit has information on how to develop patient registries. So if you're interested, visit the link, and you'll learn more there. So now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First, we have Suzanne Rossov. She is the Research Programs Manager at NORD, and she will give an overview of what registries are, the various types of registries, and the benefits to participating in them. Suzanne works closely with our patient organizations um, with their registries on our platform called I Am Rare. Uh, she also helps them tailor their registries to their specific needs. Following Suzanne's presentation, we will have Alexandra Cruz. She is the research coordinator at the Platelet Disorder Support Association, and she will tell us about her experience with launching a registry and the challenges that they face at her organization while doing that. I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne now. Suzanne, go ahead and take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, today, I'll be talking to you about what research is and why it's important, what a registry is, the types of registries out there, how to implement and manage a registry, introduction to the IRM Rare Registry Program, how you can get involved, and then some resources. So what exactly is research? Well, research is the process of discovery. It's how you go from knowing very little or nothing at all to putting the pieces of a puzzle together. And you may be wondering why I have pictures of a horse and cars on here. Well, we wouldn't have gotten to the point of having a Tesla without that process of discovery. Uh, so one of the things that uh, has happened is when asked what people wanted in a horse, they said they wanted a faster horse. And so there came the first vehicle. And from then on, the process has gotten better to the point where we have safer cars, more reliable cars, faster cars, fancy cars. And so not all research is from that process of uh, uh, discovery uh, or purposeful discovery. Some research happens um, and some discoveries happen by accident. And I'm going to turn back to the biological sciences now and give that example, and it's probably one of the best known examples, and that's the discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming in 1928. He was running a set of experiments. He came to check on his petri dishes and noticed that there were certain petri dishes that had bacteria that were completely cleared from the dish. And he wondered what caused that. And so that was through by complete accident that he was able to, found that in, to find that information. So now in healthcare, we want to specifically enrich the understanding of people's lived experiences. We want to understand that. There are health shocks that occur uh, to patients, and they're unpredictable, and we want to be able to map that. And then finally, there is power in data. So <clears throat> by conducting research, you have the ability to get cures, to obtain answers to questions that uh, had no answers before. 
Uh, one of the examples that comes to mind for me is Dr. Marshall Summer, who had a registry in the 80s, and it was for urea cycle disorder, and it went from having no treatment for and a very uh, bleak outcome for patients to the point where 95% of patients have a very positive outlook today. <clears throat> so what exactly is a registry? Well, a registry is a tool that you can use to collect information about individuals, and some of the information that you can collect includes specific information about a disease or, that di or a diagnosis, general patient demographics, genetic information, patient reported outcomes, uh, comprehensive medical data, so lab reports is an example, uh, clinical trial matching, and any other type of information that you would like to collect about a patient's history. There are two main types of registries. There are contact registries, uh, and this is primarily for obtaining uh, basic demographics and essentially contact information for patients. So if you would like to be matched with a clinical trial, for instance, you would input your information into a contact registry and then you'd be contacted if you were a match. Patient registries are a couple of different things. Uh, one can be a general uh, survey information, but the more specific of those two types of patient registries are natural history studies. This is a special type of registry that collects longitudinal data. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. Who can enter data? Well, anyone can. If you're a patient, if you're the caregiver for that patient, if you're a clinician, you're able to enter that data. Or you can be a combination of these. So some registries only accept data from clinicians. Others are patient-reported uh, outcomes uh, registries. And then others will, other types of registries will allow for clinicians, patients, and caregivers to input data. So what is the current landscape for rare patients? In general, all patients will face some obstacle. Uh, think about it for rare patients, that is uh, magnified by 10 or more. So on average, it takes about five to seven years for a diagnosis. Only 5% of rare diseases have any kind of treatment. There's extensive lifelong medical needs. The cost of care is incredibly high. Uh, there are few medical experts. And when we say few, it could be where that medical expert is not even in the country or the state that you're, you, in which you reside. There's very little known about the rare diseases. And then there's very little research that's ongoing about this disease. And that I want to spend a little bit of time on because it's a two-way, it's a double-edged sword. Researchers who are interested in uh, studying a particular rare disease face obstacles in the, in the format of funding. They cannot obtain funding from places such as the NIH because there just isn't enough data for the NIH to invest in that type of research on that magnitude. And then for places where there are uh, funds available for research, Perhaps there aren't enough researchers who are interested in conducting that research. Uh, social isolation is another big issue. Once you've received a diagnosis, where do you go? How do you find a community? How do you then partner with someone, whether it be clinician, uh, whether it be other patients, or just the general public to understand what you're going through as a patient or a caregiver for someone with a rare disease? And then populations are small and they're scattered. So what exactly is the natural history of a disease? The natural history of a disease is when you're able to follow the progression of that disease from the pre-symptomatic all the way through when you've been diagnosed and then continuing on throughout that patient's lifetime. So why exactly is this natural history study data important? Well, first of all, you want to inform patient care and best practices. You want to be able to have enough information where when you go to a hospital or your primary care physician, even if they've never encountered that particular rare disease, there's a protocol in place. They know what to do. There's documentation that's available uh, to allow for uh, the best care to be provided to a rare patient. 
You want to assess patient and caregiver experiences and preferences, contribute to that disease's understanding, identify research priorities such as genetic, molecular, and physical basis for, research, for rare diseases. You want to estimate the number of affected patients and patients potentially available to participate in research, so patient cohorts. You want to evaluate the individual and global economic burden of the disease, inform drug development, and provide an avenue for biospecimen collection. So how do patients benefit? So what's in it for you as a patient if you participate? Well, first of all, you are empowered as the patient and a part of the patient community to participate in research. Again, remember, there is power in data. So you have the ability to participate regardless of where you're located because natural history studies and many of these registries are online tools. So it doesn't matter where you are, you can still donate your data. You can choose uh, which studies you'd like to participate in. You can do a natural history study or you can do a contact registry. So maybe you don't want to provide any survey information, you just want to be contacted about clinical trials, then you have that ability as well. Participating in natural history studies educates patients, caregivers, researchers, and other stakeholders. So it begins to bring the community together. And it falls right into the next bullet point, which is it provides opportunities for researchers to collaborate on projects locally, internationally, and across disease states. So if there is something one particular researcher was looking at and another researcher became interested, maybe it's not a point of view that has ever been discussed or a research topic that has come to the mind of any particular researcher. So it opens up those doors, opportunities. And then finally, it provides incentives for leveraging patient-centered outcomes research. So again, you're at the helm. You're the one putting that data in. You have the power, and patients know best what is happening uh, with their health and how best to describe that information. So because you're able to inform that, inform, uh, you can provide that information, you can help to inform the development of novel treatments or the repurposing of existing drugs. So now I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk a little bit about implementing a registry. I cannot estimate this enough, um, and I can't overstate this enough, Plan ahead, plan, plan, plan. Do your research. So does a registry already exist for the disease or the condition? Does that registry collect information that aligns with your goals? Are there opportunities to collaborate with existing partners? And I've put two resources here. So if you want to see if there is already a registry, uh, ARC, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, they have a list of registries, as does the Natural Institute, Institutes of Health. You can search their repositories to see if there are any registries for a particular uh, disease state. You want to create a study plan or design. So decide on the type of information that you want to collect, how you want to use that information, how long that study is going to last. You want to get help. So. Running, uh, managing a registry is no simple uh, task. There's a lot of planning involved and you will need resources. So does a patient organization exist that is capable of managing this registry? Is there any kind of organizational support such as monetary support? Um, human resources and the skill set. So not just anyone to be able to volunteer, but can they provide a particular a set of skills to help manage that registry. An advisory board, do you have medical experts uh, in that disease field who you can call upon to provide some kind of guidance when planning your study and designing your study? Do you have someone who is willing to take on the responsibility of managing the overall study, so the project lead or the principal investigator? someone who will manage the day-to-day -day runnings of that study, a registry coordinator. And then, of course, you want to be able to communicate with the disease population. You want to communicate with uh, industry and uh, clinicians. So marketing, lots of communication. And this is the last bullet 
under number three, but it's incredibly important, sustainability and survivability. So what happens if management changes, if the PI no longer wants to be the PI? How do you keep the study going and who will take on these responsibilities? So that's something you need to think about, especially for long-term studies. Assess the interest of the target audience to participate in research. So do you have the backing of the, disease, uh, the rare disease community or that particular patient group? Consider the ethical conduct of your study. Patients' rights need to be accounted for, so you want to ensure that you enlist the help of an institutional review board and they are responsible for um, ensuring that your study will be conducted in an ethical manner and patients' rights will be protected. And then once you've gone through all these steps, you want to select the provider that best aligns with your study goals. And the provider means that registry platform. Who will you choose to house your study? And this is just a graphic of the steps. So, Research, decide on the type of registry, assess the resources, gauge the community, design the study, choose the IRB, choose a platform, build a registry, and then finally launch. So I will now tell you a little bit about the IMWare platform and some of the things that you, sh you would want to look for uh, when selecting a registry platform. So <clears throat> the AMRA platform, it's a research tool designed to capture the natural history of a disease. It's a patient-driven registry, and the information that's collected is used to describe the disease over time, identify genetic, demographic, environmental, and other variables associated with that disease, uh, define a disease population, including a description of the full range of disease manifestations and subtypes. Now, once you've begun to look for a registry platform, you want to make sure that that platform is safe, it's protected, the data will be safe. Um, you want to make sure that it's scalable and it's reliable. Who owns that platform? Is it managed by a third party or is it run in-house? Um, does it allow for any kind of analysis of your data? What type of support do you obtain from the registry provider? Is it 24-7 support, customer support. Do you need to make an appointment each time? You would like to obtain some kind of support? Do you have guidance from the moment you'd like to implement your study all the way to the point of launching? So think about all of those things. Do you have access to um, standardized data dictionaries? So are there pre-made surveys that you can use, or do you need to create everything from scratch? Do you want a hybrid? So do you want surveys that exist and then have surveys that you can create as well? Are there opportunities to compare the data across disease states? How are the surveys laid out? Is it easy for a participant to go in and complete surveys? And then how are you keeping patients or participants engaged once they're in that study? So customizable look and feel, you want to definitely grab the attention of your participants once they've landed on your registry page. So are you able to customize that page for your registry? Here's, some, here's an example of what a survey could look like. You see here that the survey is uh, customizable. So there are drop downs, there are check boxes, so select all that applies, or single response, or even a free text response. And then to keep participants engaged, they have access to the de-identified aggregate data. What does that even mean? It means that once a participant has completed a certain number of surveys, they're able to compare their responses to other participants without seeing any of their personal information. It's just the response to a question. This is just another representation of that. And then on the management side of the registry, how are you able to keep track of participants? Are you able to easily pull reports? Um, how do you engage with participants if they have not completed surveys? Can you quickly and easily pull that information together to then re-engage with participants? And then finally, is there a place where you have available resources? 
can you see user guides uh, to help you if customer service is not available? Is there a place where you can engage with other registry coordinators or registry managers so that you can exchange ideas? Those are some of the things you want to keep in mind as you select a registry platform. I wanted to end with this uh, quote from ARC, and it states, experts agree that these registries are transforming patient, caregiver support, and advocacy groups into research organizations. They also provide patients and family members another way to become engaged in research beyond the role of advisor or informant to researcher-generated studies. And I really like that first question because most of the groups who come to us as clients, they are not research experts. They are volunteers. They are patients. They are caregivers of patients. And they recognize the importance of starting a registry. And by the time they've launched their registries and they have completely involved themselves, they become research experts and their patient organizations become research organizations. Pharma and industry and clinicians are the ones who are now reaching out to, the, to these organizations for data because, again, there is power in the data. <clears throat> so how can you get involved? Well, at NORD, we have several opportunities. Through the education and advocacy departments, you as a um, clinician or any other professional are able to, medical professional are able to contribute rare disease reports. You can become a NORD member organization if you're a patient organization. Uh, through policy at the state level, you're able to join the Rare Ex Action Network. Uh, and then, of course, through research. Participate in research or start or join a patient registry. And if you'd like to learn more about that from NORD's research department, please email research at rarediseases.org. Here are some additional resources. So if you'd like to read more about registries, feel free to go to any one of these links. And this paper in particular uh, talks a little bit about the Orphan Drug Act and uh, the importance uh, and the role NORD has played in uh, the rare disease space. <clears throat> over the past 35 years. This is a quick slide of some of the registries on the IRMware platform. And then, again, to learn more, please visit NORD's website or email research at rarediseases.org. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Alexandra Cruz. She is one of the uh, she's a representative from the Platelet Disorder Support Association, and she's one of the registries on the IMR platform. She will be talking to you about her experience uh, with managing a registry and uh, what she's experienced from it so far. Alex? Thanks, Joe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexandra Cruz, and I am the research coordinator for the Platelet Disorder Support Association, or PDSA. We support patients with immune thrombocytopenia and other bleeding disorders through a variety of programs. And this year, we're actually excited to be celebrating our 20th anniversary. Historically, we've done a lot to educate ITP patients about their disease and treatment options, providing a connection to some of the top ITP experts in the world, and support groups for patients to connect with others living through the same disease. But it's not until recently that we have increased our efforts in advocacy and research. With the recent rise in patient-powered research, we knew that we needed, that needed to change. Uh, in 2016, we are one of 19 rare disease organizations to begin collaboration with NORD on the I Am Rare Natural History Study patient registry platform. And we launched our ITP registry on Rare Disease Day, February 28th of last year. Uh, as Sue mentioned today, I'm going to speak a bit about our experience managing our own registry. So we joke a lot at PDSA about how Immune thrombocytopenia is difficult to pronounce, but more difficult to live with. ITP is an autoimmune bleeding disorder which affects platelets in your blood. It affects around 50,000 people in the United States, so it is considered a rare disease, further necessitating the need to understand and be able to characterize our disease population. ITP is different for everyone in the way that symptoms present and the severity of disease, which makes it difficult to manage treatment, and there's currently no cure. 
we are lucky that we have around 10 different treatments for ITT, but that variability in pathophysiology means not everyone will respond to a specific therapy, experience a lot of terrible side effects, and some treatments don't even work for some patients at all. Although registries in most big data sets examine populations as a whole, I want to make it very clear that data aggregate is only important because of the individual stories that patients contribute. This is my friend, Ayla, who has had ITP since she was three years old. Uh, and this is Ayla by the numbers, or what she has gone through as a result of her ITP. This is just one patient's experience, but the power of data also makes Ayla experience easier to compare and contrast with other ITP patients and collectively will help to construct a full picture of ITP along with the quantitative and qualitative data contributed by other patients. So now that you know a little bit about ITP, I'm going to talk about what we considered prior to beginning our own registry and lessons that I'd urge you to consider before beginning your own. I want to stress that primarily it's important to identify why your disease community needs a registry and what data the registry should collect. Here are three broad topics to think about. First, what do you want to learn about your disease and what is the burden of disease? Second, what does your patient population need and what is missing from treatment and care? And third, why is a registry vital to your disease community? So for us, first we thought about what we wanted to learn about the burden of disease on ITP patients. We considered symptoms. So ITP presents physically through bleeding and bruising caused by a low platelet count and with debilitating fatigue. ITP, like many diseases, also greatly impacts mental and emotional health. We thought about what we knew about therapies. So again, ITP patients cycle through treatments with limitations and challenges. And perhaps most importantly, according to our patients, we wanted to learn about quality of life. ITP patients experience impaired emotional, functional, and reproductive health, work and social life, and often have feelings of anxiety, fear, depression, embarrassment, isolation, and inadequacy. So we knew right away these details of living with ITP were things we wanted the registry to capture so we could then compare between patients and determine the incidence of these issues for research purposes. Next, we thought about the unmet need of ITP patients. As you mentioned earlier, like many rare diseases, our patients need more efficient diagnostic tests, treatments that last in better quality of life, increased awareness in public and professional health communities and comprehensive treatment centers to improve care and outcomes, research and federal funding opportunities. And we hope that through patient experience data collected through the registry, we would then be able to provide diagnosticians information about the disease, inform treatments to lead to better quality of life, provide hard data on what it's like to live with ITP, and attempt to increase funding opportunities. Lastly, we thought about why a natural history study specifically would help ITP patients. Your registry can target whatever information you'd like, but generally they should establish baseline information, longitudinal disease progression, and identify patient reported outcomes, characterize and describe the population as a whole, assist the community with the development of recommendations for standards of care, assist researchers studying the pathophysiology of disease and interventional outcomes, and support the design of clinical trials for new treatments. Once we established what we wanted to learn to help ITP patients and researchers most, we were ready to begin construction of our registry. Our registry has five surveys, which were constructed from common data elements in conjunction with NORD, but we were able to tailor each of our survey questions and potential responses so that they were ITP specific. Our first survey collects information on demographics, insurance, education, and employment. We next ask about medical and diagnostic data, so we examine diagnostic tests performed, doctor's visits, family history, and female reproduction if applicable. We then review treatments and symptoms and inquire about types of medications taken, the frequency and dosage of the therapies, diet, and past surgeries. And finally, we ask about quality of life, trying to construct a picture of enjoyment of life, fatigue, sleep, pain, social activities, and overall mental and physical health. Your registry can have as many surveys as you'd like or collect whatever information you think is important, but I think it's also crucial to, one, only find out information that's important to your community, guiding your scope using the questions I suggested earlier, and two, be considerate of your patient community's time. 
Most patients want to help in research, but most patients are also dealing with the additional time commitment and stress of their disease, and you don't want to create any survey fatigue. After constructing our database of questions, making sure that our staff are properly HIPAA and Institutional Review Board certified to protect patients' privacy and ensure the ethics of our research and testing our registry platform, we began to do a lot of the marketing legwork for recruitment and retention. As you can see from the numbers on the slide, the ITB community got really excited about the registry as soon as it launched, and it's because we started getting patients and caregivers excited and informed about the registry months prior to official launch. We did a number of things to disseminate the purpose of our registry as well as promote enrollment within our publications. This is an article from our fall newsletter that goes out to ITP patients and caregivers. So again, even prior to launch, we wanted to start expressing the importance of the registry. We promoted on our official website. We leveraged social media channels. And this was unintentional, but a lot of our patients did work in recruiting others by talking about how excited they were about the registry and that they signed up. We also utilized our website and made sure that all aspects, benefits, and any potential concerns from patients about the registry are explained. We also provided step-by-step -step instructions on how to register to make the enrollment process as easy as possible. This is a flyer we'll be disseminating to our medical advisors and other hematologists who treat ITP, explaining the registry, why it's important, and what kind of impact the registry will have on ITP research. The intention is really bifold in that physicians will help recruit patients and will also want to utilize the de-identified data themselves to help advance research. We also have information about the importance of registries and any common questions directly on the registry platform. Now that it's been a year and a half since our launch, how has the registry been useful to our patient advocacy organization and to our patient community? We've been contacted by key medical leaders and ITP to collaborate on research studies that address some of the issues patients face utilizing the data, and we've partnered with industry so that they understand what's missing in the ITP treatment paradigm as they're developing therapies. We've shared some of the preliminary results of the registry with our patients. It is so important to make sure that patients not only understand the importance of the registry, but are assured that we are actually processing the data and want them to know what we've learned. Informed patients are in a better position to advocate for themselves in their journey toward better health. We released two patient-friendly visual summaries of a few of our surveys, are working on a paper to be published, and will also be presenting updated preliminary findings as a poster at our ITP patient conference in July. Additionally, last year we were lucky to have a meeting with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration who helped to sponsor a portion of the IMR program and recognize the importance of patient experience data. They were so excited to learn about our registry and some of our key findings. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about what you can learn about your patient community from a registry through sharing some quick facts of what we have already learned so far from the ITP registry surveys. So 83% of our registry participants are from the United States and 7% are Canadian. The rest, of course, are from other countries. Uh, our registry is only in English currently, but it does have an international reach. The median current age of participants is 35 years old, and the median age of diagnosis is 27 years. Uh, this does make sense as those who enroll in the registry would tend to be younger just for technological reasons, but ITP doesn't really discriminate based on age. 63% of our patients were diagnosed with their ITP within a year, but it did take one of our patients 37 years to wait for his official diagnosis. ITP treat patients are typically on a treatment for around four years with a third receiving steroids, although half of these patients currently don't receive treatment as is reflected in the common watch and wait approach um, to ITP treatment dependent on stability of the patient and severity of their disease. Patients visit their physicians on average five times per year, and almost half had visited their doctor more than 10 times per year. As I mentioned earlier, there's no explicit diagnostic test, so ITP is a diagnosis of exclusion. Most patients have on average four tests before they are officially diagnosed, 
and two-thirds of patients are tested for other bleeding or immunological disorders prior to receiving their official diagnosis. As with many diseases, ITP has an impact on the mental health of a patient in addition to physical manifestations. Almost half feel emotionally impacted, 88% feel fatigued, 89% have experienced depression, and over half had felt anxious as a result of their disease. This is really just a snapshot of what you can learn from registries, which is only going to help address the unmet needs of your patient population through collection of patient experience data. And while the results of our registry have been exciting and eye-opening thus far, getting to this point was, of course, not without its challenges. So we considered safety and privacy issues. We make clear who owns the data. We established that the registry is IRB approved and HIPAA certified. The platform is a completely encrypted database, thanks to NORD, and the registry is patient consented. So your data is not going to show up in the registry unless you agree for it to be, and we will never share any identifying information about patients. We also thought some patients might not have enough time or energy to complete surveys. We tried to be considerate of their time and also express the importance of the registry in all of our marketing messaging. We'll also be rolling out an incentive program in a few months to be able to compensate patients for their time and encourage completion of all the surveys to ensure robustness of our data. We have run into some technical difficulties, which of course is to be expected. So we really try to ensure that our staff is accessible to answer any technical questions, and we work closely with NORD's IT department on any issues. And a last thing that you want to consider, I think, before starting your registry and while you're managing one is how are you going to involve patients? Will they be equal partners in research? Will they comprise a patient review panel? Will they help you to recruit, retain, or disseminate findings? Uh, and this is kind of a, a trick question because the answer is they should have the opportunity to do all of the above, and it's really important for them to be active participants in research. And to close out, I'd like to share some general takeaways from our experience. So if you want to start your own registry, make sure you ask the right question. How does the data collected provide an overview of your patient population? Have a plan as you recommended with marketing, with recruitment, with retention. What are you going to do with the data once collected and why is it important? And finally, involve the right people, whether that's patients, medical advisors, patient advocacy groups, or other key opinion leaders. So I just wanted to take a second and say that PDSA is so grateful to NORD for having the opportunity to begin our natural history study patient registry uh, because we know that our registry will lead to better treatment, better understanding of the disease, and potentially a cure. We look forward in the future to future collaboration with medical advisors, patients, and industry to accomplish our goal of addressing the unmet needs of ITP patients. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra, and thank you, Sue, for your really informative presentations. Um, we have collected quite a number of questions during the webinar, we've also collected a number of them before the webinar. So we will try and answer as many as possible. I'm sorry if we're unable to get to your question. If for whatever reason we can't, um, please feel free to email us at education at rarediseases.org. Um, I think we're gonna try and answer um, them sort of, because many of them are related. So we're gonna try and answer as many of them um, and hopefully we're addressing um, most people's questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Sue and Alexandra, um, and they're going to start going through some of the questions that we've um, received before the webinar, and then we'll start going through the ones that we received during the webinar. Thanks, Sheikha. Uh, so as Sheikha has mentioned, we've gotten quite a few questions. Uh, one of the first uh, are are pediatric registries different from general patient registries? And this is an excellent question because one of the things, and I can speak to the I Am Rare platform, one of the things that uh, has been taken into account is, uh, is for participants who can provide uh, responses for themselves, so they are self-reporters, or participants who are unable to do that. And it could be a pediatric uh, patient, or it could be an adult patient who's just incapable of participating. So that's something that you'd want to take into account, and you would want to uh, 
make sure that this is something that falls within your study design. So some registries are solely for pediatrics, for pediatric patients, and then others encompass both populations. Again, this is completely up to uh, your study design, what you're hoping to get out of the information, and who uh, is affected by any particular disease. Is it solely children or are adults also? Is this a disease that carries over into the adult population? So really good question there. Are there any special considerations that we recommend when managing an international registry? So yes. You want to absolutely take into account your IRB, the Institutional Review Board. You want to make sure that any of the laws are governed by uh, what's written in your protocol and your study participants will be covered. You want to take into account your medical advisory committee. And again, just your study design. Who do you want to cover in the study? Uh, are there specific rare disease organizations you need uh, volunteer, who need volunteer assistance in starting registries for patients? So again, you can check on ARC or the NIH's uh, website to see if there are any registries. Uh, if you have a specific interest in a rare disease, check to see if there's a registry that already uh, exists for that rare disease or any other disease and then reach out to the, or the patient organization uh, who may be backing that, that uh, registry to see if they require any help. Also keep in, keep in mind that they might be looking for a particular skill set. So uh, you're welcome to volunteer. Uh, just make sure that you do your research on your end as well. I'm going to turn it over to Alex to see if she has anything that came in on her end. Sure. So there were a bunch of questions about ways to publicize or promote a patient registry to the research community, clinicians, research funders. And I think what's really exciting is that a lot of times once you start promoting the registry, word just kind of organically gets to researchers or you can even contact them directly. Uh, a lot of researchers already really understand the importance of registries and natural history studies. They know how much work gets put into them. So if you want to collaborate with industry, with researchers, I would focus more on explaining the more technical side of your registry, but just steps you've taken to protect patients' information and validate the data. Uh, I think it's also exciting because it's not like a clinical trial where the recruitment is so stringent. The data in registries are already readily available. There was a question about ideas for telling the story to patient families in a way that they will choose to participate, if not for their child, but for future generations as well. Uh, again, as I expressed through our marketing materials, expressing that the information you share is going to stimulate the exploration of new treatments, better biological understandings, potentially a cure. I think also sharing findings is also useful, so being able to communicate those who would be interested in enrolling as well as trying to keep your retention numbers up, just expressing here's what we're finding so far. And the more people who are able to enroll and are able to complete their surveys, um, that just means that the data is more robust and it's more valid for once research is done on the uh, registered data. Um, there was a question about what special qualities and qualifications are needed before one can start a registry. Um, I think first there needs to be an interest in research and a background, whether that's a, a medical advisor or a patient advocate or a patient in the disease. So if you have some kind of a connection, I think it's always better. But if you're going to be managing the registry specifically, you have to be certified by the Institutional Review Board for Research Ethics and pass health information privacy training. Additional certifications I don't think are completely necessary and neither is an MD or a PhD, but it's always, always helpful, um, especially if you can get some kind of help or advising from somebody with an advanced science degree or a background in research. And additionally, this is a really good opportunity to collaborate with any medical advisors if your organization has any, or to be able to reach out to some key opinion leaders in your field. So a really great question just came in, and it's, with many rare diseases come comorbidities that are of themselves rare diseases. How are those variables taken into effect on a patient registry? Again, this comes back to your study design. What type of information are you looking to capture? How will you 
uh, design your surveys to collect this information. Uh, are you going to be collecting lab reports? Are you going to be following up in any other means? So all of this information can be captured in that natural history study or patient registry, uh, just completely depending upon how you design your study, which is why we keep saying plan, plan, plan. Know exactly what you want to get out of that registry before you dive in. Another question, who owns the data? Uh, so I can speak for this <laughs> platform, the IMRare platform. Each patient organization or organization that has a registry on the IMRA platform owns their data. Once you have, uh, we've built your registry and handed it over to you, that data is yours. Um, and so then this is another reason why your uh, scientific advisory board or your medical advisory committee is very important because how you disseminate that data will need to be carefully constructed so that, again, you are protecting your patient's rights, those people who have taken the time to donate the data, making sure that their rights are never violated. There was also a question that came in about what is the range for the number of hours needed to manage the registry per month or per year. Um, it's really dependent on, I would say, which part of the registry cycle you're in. So. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of legwork that goes into the marketing side of things and to making sure that uh, your data sets and your surveys are as valid and robust as they possibly can be, really trying to fine tune it. Um, my organization has a full-time staff of five people and I am the only one who is overseeing the registry completely, but we do have a lot of help from our medical advisors and we do have a lot of help from patients, but I probably spend anywhere from 10 to 20 hours a week either answering emails or making sure that the data is valid. Um, and of course, if I'm trying to prepare a publication of any sort or a presentation, then there's more work that goes in there. But it's completely doable, especially with a small staff. And I'd like to add on to Alex's response and just provide another example. Um, being that we are in the rare disease Space. Many of the patient organizations were started by patients themselves or caregivers. So they have regular day jobs. They're taking care of themselves, or the or uh, the care or caregivers are taking care of patients, and they're volunteering uh, to run the registry. We have groups where there's a single person, similar to Alex here, who is Alexandra, who is running the day-to-day -day for the, the registry. They're doing all of the marketing. They're doing all of the recruitment. Uh, and then there are other uh, patient organizations that are much more um, well-funded and defined, and they can have a few uh, volunteers or paid staff. So it completely depends upon the resources that a, uh, an organization has available to them. Uh, and then there was another question that came in. Uh, about knowing how many patients you need in order to either start a registry or how to pull the data out of the registry. And again, being the rare disease community, it would completely depend <laughs> upon how many patients there are available in that community um, in order to provide that data. Ultimately, you want to be able to paint that picture. Uh, with determining which number you need to have in order to begin doing any kind of data analysis, that comes back to relying upon your medical advisory board to help you to figure out what a target number would be to obtain enough data to begin any kind of analysis. Uh, there was a question about how can people be entered in a registry before they know they have the disease um, and this participant said, isn't that pre-symptomatic period the most important to study to help people detect a disease early? Um, and you're totally right. I think why natural history studies in particular um, are so important is because it is able to, they are able to track um, the disease progression over time. And a lot of questions will not only ask prospective questions, but also retrospective questions. So asking, um, what kind of experience were you having when you were first diagnosed? What were the different types of diagnostic tests you received? Um, but of course, it's difficult to be able to 
track all of the data that you would actually need um, in that pre-symptomatic period if you don't officially have the diagnosis yet. Uh, there's another question about uh, what, is, what does patient-driven mean? Uh, patient-driven means that patients are the uh, individuals and their caregivers are the individuals who are inputting the data rather than having clinicians input that data. So it's patient-centered outcomes research. Uh, patients input that data. Uh, there was another question about training for the IMR platform. And uh, we actually do not typically do in-person training because, again, it's web-based, so our training is online. Um, for our registry clients, we can do one-on-one -on -one training or we, we can do group trainings via very similar webinar setting, uh, but our training is online primarily. There was a question about how long does it take to generate meaningful data considering that registries are longitudinal studies. So it really does depend, I think, on your patient population. Um, so as Sue said earlier, the number of patients within a registry for it to be valid is really dependent on the proportion to the full patient community. Um, in my experience in research, I've heard that in rare diseases, over about 100 patients is a really good number. Um, 50 is great, um, but I think in terms of timeline for generating meaningful data, um, probably over a year. But what's more important, I would say, is making sure that if you are having a registry that has multiple different surveys, making sure that all of your participants have completed all five or however many surveys that your registry in particular has um, so that you're not sending out an incomplete data set. So it's more the robustness of the data, not necessarily, um, I think, probably the number. Uh, there was a question about who constitutes the IRB or an IRB. Um, the Institutional Review Board, they are experts in many different fields. Some are MDs, some are PhDs in fields uh, ranging from the biological sciences to uh, philosophy to regulatory science, and they go through um, any of your study documents that are submitted prior to launching a study, and they make sure that your study is comprehensive and that, again, patients' rights will be uh, accounted for. Uh, they ensure that your consent form will communicate with your protocol, so the two sets of documents complement each other, um, and then any kind of marketing materials that you put out there, they will review them as well to ensure that there's nothing that could be seen as um, uh, forcing a patient to uh, enroll in a study. It should be of their own free will, completely voluntary. So the IRB is there to ensure that any language that goes out to patients <clears throat> will be in a very neutral tone. Uh, there was another question about um, the IRB requirements for setting up a registry. Uh, so Alex already mentioned one thing, which was you would need to be uh, city trained. Um, so this is the research ethics training. Uh, you'd need to have a principal investigator uh, for your a study design. So protocol, consent forms, any kind of marketing materials. Uh, additional study staff, so will you have co-investigators on your study? Um, and then, of course, if you are interested in starting a registry, most IRBs, of which I'm aware, are willing to speak with you ahead of time to help you to figure out what you need to do, especially during your study planning phase. Um, so that's what you would need to do to get started with the IRB. Uh, and then another question came in about what constitutes a successful registry. Uh, patient, patient participation, that would be the biggest thing. Not just getting people to sign up on day one, but having them continue to submit that data, submitting it on time so that you can capture a really good longitudinal picture. Um, all of these intervals, 
uh, and then be able to map your data and analyze your data. So having that continued uh, participation and engagement from patients. And Sue, we are coming up on the hour. Um, I thank you both so much for your very informative presentations. Um, thank you for sharing your insights, Alexandra, on starting your own registry. Um, we really appreciate it. If you have any questions, and there were a lot, <laughs> if you have any questions that didn't get answered, please email us at education at rarediseases.org, and someone on staff will follow up with you. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us today. We really appreciate it. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.